Uh, the title of this morning's sermon is The Prophet, Priest, and King of Lamentations. Well, we've been going through the book of Lamentations, and the last several weeks have been heartfelt and profound. If you remember, four weeks ago, we were confronted, comforted by the fact that when we lament, we never lament alone. Jesus laments with us, and our God, he is a God of lamentation. Hashtag, there is no salvation without lamentation. Three weeks ago, we learned about the meaning of the fall and exile of Jerusalem. It was a reminder of the fall and exile of Adam. It was a teaching moment about sin, and it was a foreshadowing of the salvation of Jesus Christ. Hashtag, look and see if there is any sorrow like Jesus' sorrow. Two weeks ago, we considered the judgment of God, the judgment that Jesus gives, and the judgment that Jesus takes. Hashtag, like a summer garden full of flowers. And finally, last week, if you remember, we looked at what the narrator of the Book of Lamentations, why he was really lamenting. He lamented because it seemed to him that God's people lost God himself. That that communion bond, that covenant relationship between God and his people was over. Hashtag Mulan, the daughter of Zion has lost the Father. Well, Highland, I don't know about you, but these last four Sundays have been really tough for me. The reason why is because there's been there's so much suffering and so much misery that is in this book of Lamentations. The poetry is very sad and very dark and I can only begin to imagine what the saints of old went through when Jerusalem was destroyed. And so these last four Sundays have been tough. But to be honest, in my humble opinion, today it gets worse. Today it gets worse because the narrator of Lamentations tells us what happened to the children of Jerusalem? In the aftermath of the fall and exile of Jerusalem, there were infants and babies in the streets of the city. And the infants and the babies in Jerusalem suffered and wept and were left to die. Imagine hearing the sobbing of a three-year-old boy in an alley, and imagine that you find him, and you see that he's covered in dust and ashes, but he's also covered in dried up sweat and tears and blood. And imagine you see his mother come up to him and slowly pick him up in her arms. But his life is being poured out on her bosom. Imagine hearing the helpless cry of a 14-month-old girl in a poor home. And you draw near to her and you see that her arms and her legs are too thin. You see how hungry she is. And you ask as well, where is the bread? Where is the wine? 
Or imagine two twins, two infant baby twins lying on the ground facing one another. But when you go close up to them, you notice that they are barely moving at all. They are faint, faint like wounded men. Think about the infants. Think about the babies. This is what happened to them in Lamentations. They suffered. They wept. And so the narrator is cut to the heart. He writes, My eyes are spent with weeping. My stomach churns. My bile is poured out to the ground because of the destruction of the daughter of my people, because the infants and babies faint in the streets of the city. But it gets even worse. There is something mentioned here in today's passage that is absolutely horrifying and unspeakable. In verse 20, we are told that when Jerusalem fell, parents resorted to cannibalism. And parents ate their own children in order to survive. And so the narrator writes, Should women eat the fruit of their womb, the children of their tender care? Brothers and sisters, words cannot begin to explain how messed up this is, how so messed up this is. Imagine adults who would kill their infants, murder their babies so that they could eat them. Imagine mothers and fathers who raised their daughters and their sons, but they became so hungry that they, they killed them, they boiled them, they roasted them over a fire, they cooked them, and they, then they ate them. The children of their tender care, cut into pieces, put into their mouths, and then swallowed into their stomachs. This madness, this wickedness really happened. It happened. The infants and the babies were murdered. They were silenced. Dear Highland, all of this is why sin is so terrible. All of this is why you must hate sin. You must hate sin with all your heart and your mind. The narrator holds nothing back at the end of this second poem. It's a wake-up call. We must never forget this, that sin leads to heartbreaking loss. And sin is evil and demonic. Sin leads people to do things that are unthinkable and unimaginable. Sin leads to generational death. Sin brings terror and misery and suffering. Sin is the reason why God has prepared justice and wrath and judgments and hell. Let us be a church that endeavors to hate sin. That is part of what we are to do. Hate sin through and through. The infants, the babies. What a terrible thing that has happened here in the book of Lamentations. One of the main reasons why all of this happened, why sin was allowed 
why it was allowed to run rampant in Jerusalem was because there were false prophets who spoke to God's people. And God's people listened to them. Now this may not be as heartbreaking as what happened to the infants and the babies a few minutes ago, but this part about false prophets, it's equally worthy of lament. This is what happened before, during, and even after the fall and exile of Jerusalem. According to verse 14, false prophets gave God's people false and deceptive information about God and his word. But this is so messed up because God is holy. God hates sin. And God is a God of truth, not deception. And God loves his people and he wants to speak to his people and for a false prophet to get in the way of that, to twist his words, to disrupt that communication, that communion bond is absolutely terrible. It's sin. And so these false prophets, they took all of God's truth and they twisted it so that it sounded more appealing to the people and eventually the people fell for it and the people got used to it. And that led to more sin and that was why ultimately the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. Instead of exposing sin, and instead of exposing iniquity against God, these false prophets, what did they do? They covered up sin. They encouraged sin. They even blessed it. And when God does not say things, they say something. And when God says something, they say something else. And this ridiculous game that these false prophets played was a dangerous game that led to the death of many, many of God's people and the destruction of Jerusalem. This is why false prophecy is so wrong. It's so rebellious. These false prophets were liars. And I dare say, these false prophets were satanic. Think about it. What did the serpent in Genesis, what did the serpent, what did Satan fundamentally do in that garden with Adam? The serpent falsely taught Adam God's word. Satan is the first false teacher, the ultimate false prophet. And so this is why false prophets, the false prophets and what they did and who they were was so, so terrible and worthy of lament. Dear Highland, all of this is why we need to be so careful with God's word. Please continue to pray for me Please continue to pray for all of our pastors here at Highland as we read and study and explain and preach and bless you with God's truth, with God's word. We try to be very careful here at Highland, and we will never, ever apologize for that. Why? Because false teaching, false prophecy, the things that we are reading here in Lamentations has devastating consequences. It is written that we who teach will be judged, with, judged by God with greater strictness than you. And so please pray for me. 
Pastor Peter, Pastor James, Pastor Jason, that we will say what God says. That when God doesn't say something, we don't say anything either. Please pray that we will be careful and with fear and trembling, that we will be serious, that we will be meticulous when it comes to our preaching and our teaching. But I also pray for you, that as you read your Bibles, as you share the gospel, as you grow up and have kids and teach your children and teach other people about the Bible, that you too would teach the truth. And so, dear Highland, let us wake up and let us never forget this. Let us be a church that endeavors to love truth through and through. At the end of this poem, the narrator calls for the people of Jerusalem to repent. And the narrator himself addresses God on behalf of the city. Now, this may not seem very meaningful to you uh, compared to infants and babies, compared to false prophets, but please listen carefully as I bring this sermon to a close. This is where everything, I think, will really begin to shift and turn to Christ Jesus. The narrator, he's trying to fix everything. And his solution is simple. The people of God must cry out to him for mercy and forgiveness and grace. There seems to be no other way. And so the narrator calls upon the daughter of Zion to let her tears stream down like a torrent day and night. He calls upon God's people to arise and pour out their hearts like water before the presence of the Lord. And he himself, the narrator, he asks God for mercy and forgiveness and grace. And so he says in verse 20, Look, O Lord, and see. This is what the narrator tried. But it doesn't work. He cannot fix Jerusalem. He cannot bring the destruction to an end. His solution fails. And the reason why is he is not the prophet. He is not the priest. He is not the king that Lamentations needs. This is what is truly needed. There needs to be a true prophet who can truly speak to God's people. This prophet needs to not only speak the truth, but he needs to be the truth. This prophet needs to wield and proclaim the law of God and the gospel of God against all the false teaching. And he needs to do this in such a way that if he were to be tempted by Satan himself, who, let's say, takes him to a very high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and and says to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. This prophet needs to be able to say something like, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. There needs to be a true prophet like this. This is what is truly needed. There needs to be a true priest who can truly love and take care of God's children. This priest needs to have the power to actually resurrect dead daughters and demon-possessed sons and children who are sick and deaf and blind and crippled and with leprosy. This priest needs to let the children 
have the kingdom of God. He needs to be able to say, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. There needs to be a priest who makes known this promise, this promise of salvation, that for those who repent and believe, this promise is for them and for their children. There needs to be a true priest like this. And last but not least, there needs to be a true king. Sorry, I just lost my spot. <laughs> there needs to be a true king who will be able to um, represent his people. A king who would be able to go on the battlefield like David did against the Philistine giant and fight for his people, represent them, and win. There needs to be a king that would resolve all of lamentations, a king who could be so vitally connected to his people that he would even get baptized himself. Why? so that he would fulfill all righteousness, so that he would identify with his people, so that he would show that he is in union with his people and his people with him, so that if he were to live, they would live. If he were to die, they would die. If he would rise again from the dead, they would rise again from the dead with him. Brothers and sisters, there needed to be this kind of prophet, this kind of priest, and this kind of king. But praise be to our Father in heaven, because he has provided us with his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise be to our Lord. Infants and babies cried to their mothers, Where is bread? And where's wine? Jesus took bread and said, This is my body, which is for you. And Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Praise be to our Lord. The fall and the exile of Jerusalem was the day of the anger of God. But the fall and exile of the Son was the day when the Father poured out his anger and his wrath, his judgment on Jesus, our Savior, as he was crucified on the cross for our sins. And praise be to our God. The enemy mocks us in our sanctification. The enemy says, Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty, the joy of all the earth? Jesus describes the church, us, as the new Jerusalem, and it is as if he says, Yes, this city is the city of perfection and beauty. This city, the church, she is the joy of all the earth. She is my bride. Praise be to our Lord. The Lord has done what he has purposed. He has carried out his word, which he commanded long ago. He consummated his covenant of grace. He fulfilled his promise of salvation. He crushed the head of the serpent. And now, now we wait for his glorious return. Dear Highland, I really hope that you grow in love for Jesus.
Most of us here are not infants or babies anymore. But just remember this. You will always, always be a child of God. That's your relationship with the Father. All because of Jesus. And so I hope that you remember that. And I also hope that you grow in obedience to Christ. I don't see any of our married couples ever murdering or eating their children. But let us take great care not to murder our children in our hearts or devour them with our exasperation. Let us never underestimate our sinfulness and how it can profoundly affect other people around us, whether it's our children, whether it's our brothers and sisters, our friends here at church. Let us love as Christ Jesus, our great high priest, loved us. Dear Highland, I really hope that you grow in your trust in Jesus. Jesus is God, and as God, Jesus is the truth. And so his words are true. He never lies. And so you can trust in him fully. I really hope and pray that you trust in the Lord more and more in his word. And I also hope and pray that you grow in application of his word, his teachings, his commandments, his heart and his mind and his will. We ought to study it. We ought to study his word and be doers of his word. And so, so let us listen to Christ, who is our true prophet. And finally, and this is my last paragraph, dear Highland, I really hope that you grow in reliance on God. Remember that he is your king. There is no one greater than him. And so you can go to him for help. He is sovereign over everything in this world and over your life. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord. And Jesus represents you. You're united with him. He belongs to you and you belong to him. And so let that be a great encouragement and a comfort to you this morning as we look to Christ, our Lord and our King. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's pray.